philanthropic, humanitarian, and ultimately cosmopolitan. Now, that separation from colonialism absolves those in the development industry of the responsibility of addressing how our work is related to the various forms of rule, authority, and inequality that characterize so much of the colonial period. And importantly, what that does is emphasize the discontinuities with a colonial past and disguise the continuities with colonial rule and a post-colonial present, implying falsely then a clear distinction between the before of colonialism and the after of independence. And one of the colonial administrators said to me, uh, this is a quote, I remember once after independence in Tanzania, uh, I think he, he said Tanganyika actually, I remember once after independence in Tanganyika that a British High Commissioner told us that we had to show that we were different, that we were a new kind of Brit, not like those gin-guzzling, idle, red-faced colonial chaps. Now, what's interesting there is how were they supposed to be different? They weren't asked to think differently. They're basically asked not to have a gin and tonic at sundown and use suntan lotion. So in a way, they were asked to separate their behavior, but not a transformation of the ways in which they constructed a particular representation of other people. So there's been a political imperative to distance the international aid industry from the colonial encounter, to avoid tarnishing what is presented as a humanitarian project far removed from the supposed exploitation of the colonial era. But when we take a longer historical view, and we do include and look at the colonial in, uh, legacy, we see that there are meanings of race that emerge out of the specific conditions of colonialism, as they did out of the specific conditions of slavery. There are certain meanings and ideas about race that emerge that travel over time discursively and materially. They continue and they change over time. And I want to explore the emergence and ongoing articulation and reshaping of that racialized discourse and development. And Zaid reminds us that throughout the exchange between Europeans and their others, the one idea that is scarcely varied is that there is an us and them, each quite settled, clear, unassailably self-evident. So throughout the exchange, not just in terms of colonialism or a colonial moment. Now, if, as many post-colonial theorists have shown, colonial forms of rule were justified and sustained through a racialized discourse that positioned an uncivilized black other against a civilized white self, to what extent, then, have those forms of racial distinction traveled into international development discourse? Can development possibly be separated from a history that produced race as a marker of difference. And I think in order to begin to understand forms of global distinctions, it's necessary to ascertain how certain people and places, the West, came to exemplify cultural adaptib uh, adaptability, political competency, and modernity, while other people in other places, the so-called third world, became the symbol of cultural inflexibility, political dysfunction, and underdevelopment. Now, clearly, while biological characteristics and distinctions did provide early explanations for social inequalities between people, these later gave way to those in which differences in culture, in inverted commas, were substituted as the main reason why some people had more power and more developed than others. So rather than talk explicitly about race, we now started to talk about culture, and that was the reason that they were backward cultures rather than backward peoples. But although ideas about cultural difference substituted, apparently substituted those based on racialized understandings, they took much the same form as earlier arguments about race, but in some ways were more problematic because the difference was that cultural change seemed open to the individual, whereas the racialized native was about a collective, was about a, so was about a group, an, an associational group. So Africans who chose not to make the transition, for example, were seen as willfully obstructionist rather than quaintly and inherently backward. So in a way, that discourse of culture that replaced the discourse of race didn't really undermine those racialized formations. These forms of othering were often grounded in a discourse in which the colonized were characterized as incapable of self-government. 
And when I was interviewing colonial administrators, all of them said, when I said, well, were you prepared for going out to the colonies? And, and they said, oh, we had to read Kenneth Bradley's book, which, of course, I had to rush out onto the internet and try and get hold of, which was written in 1943. And it's called The Diary of a District Officer, and it makes a very interesting read. Now, may, a book which many of the recruits were expected to read before they arrived in their posting. And in it, it says, in many of the dependencies, so this was to try and uh, allow colonial administrators to think about their importance when they arrived in the highlands of Western Kenya or wherever they were going to be posted. In many of the dependencies, Kenneth Bradley writes, there is a great mass of primitive people who are still far off the stage in their development when politics can have any meaning for them. So the colonial administrator becomes the embodiment of everything to do with government and politics. They're also represented in, in a lot of the literature and, of course, in, in, as we know from Rana Kabani and Edward Said's work, is inherently predisposed towards wantonness, irresponsibility, and childlike characteristics. And together, these attributes come to typify colonial racialized landscapes in which the civilizing mission and the white man's burden were framed, creating then global racial spaces through the conception of Africa as the dark continent or the exotic East. So European canons, then, were always seen as the basis for evaluation and judgments of insufficiency. So what I'm trying to say is these are the kinds of representations we know about colonial forms of rule and during the colonial period, and we're trying to see, well, how have they travelled over time into development? Well, during early European expansion and exploration, those spaces were imagined as empty, right, uninhabited, and thus open to unhindered exploration and exploitation, so there was nobody there. Now, once it was acknowledged that others dwelled in these places, colonized had to adapt their previous racialized constructions and reimagine their task as a civilizing mission, implying that the colonized were not immutably inferior. <coughs> civilizing mission means that people cannot be immutably and biologically fixed in their backwardness, but there is a potential for some kind of change, for some kind of civ civility to be gained by the natives in, to, in the colonial globalized spaces. So they implied then that the colonized were not immutably inferior, but could change through their encounters with the West. Now in practice, of course, such transformations are always limited, because as Homi Baba says, the colonized could only hope to approach the civility of the colonizers, because they always remained different. So we still have that tension then between the immutability and the changeability of certain subject groups. So they were almost the same, as Baba writes, but not quite. Now these representations, I would argue, clearly didn't come to an end following decolonization. So as you lower one flag and raise the other, you don't wipe away with it all those colonial and racialized forms of representation. Because at that moment of decolonization, the relations between colonizer and colonizers, colonized might have been reworked into those between donor and beneficiary. And in terms of where UK um, assistance went in terms of developed and developing. And when we look, if you track UK development assistance, what you find is that the aid goes to former colonies. It doesn't go anywhere else. Those, that's a continuing relationship after um, supposed national independence. So colonial representations rearranged by individuals, institutions, and ideologies flowed into that post-independence period. But the difficulty here is not so much in identifying colonial genealogies of development. Right? I think it's quite easy for us to say, well, there is this colonial legacy because we don't have a disruption in, in a particular moment where we have <coughs> colonialism before and development after. What's more difficult is ascribing race to post-independence relations of international cooperation and aid. So thus far, it's been much easier to identify generalized continuities in colonial representations than to discuss how these might be racially inflected. Well, importantly, as I said before, the idea of development is based on the assumption that some people and places are less developed than others. And these distinctions in a development discourse are often framed in terms of Western benchmarks 
So we have um, levels of industrialization, gross domestic product, democratization, good governance. We've got a corruption index now that's used by the World Bank. 